I'm Katie. And I'm Steve, and this is the City of Reading Podcast. With almost 500,000 visits to the Reading Library each year, if you haven't been, you're missing out. In today's episode, we talk with Jared Tolman, Library Director for the Shasta Public Libraries, which includes the Reading, Anderson, and Bernie branches. We cover library safety, strategic plan, and cool amenities you may not know the library offers. Jared is passionate about what libraries provide to the community. And if you haven't been into the Reading Library recently, there are so many great things the library offers, in addition to books, of course. They have 3D printing, augmented reality, sewing, and so much more. A free library card even gets you access to Turtle Bay, national parks, and guided tours. Did we mention that it's free? This has been a long overdue conversation, so check it out. So my name is Jared Tolman. I am the library director for the Shasta Public Libraries. Um, as library director, I oversee all three libraries here in Shasta County, our Reading branch, our Bernie branch, and our Anderson branch. You know, a lot of times I, I feel as director of the library, you are the face of the library, right? Lots of people talk to you about the library, they ask questions about the library. And so a lot of the time I, I do exactly what we're doing here today and just talking about the library and sharing different things about the library. And, and the most common thing that I hear from people as I talk to them about what the library is, what it provides is I had no idea that the library has that. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the face of the library, if you will. Well, thanks so much for being with us here today, Jared. And maybe before we launch into fully investigating the libraries and the offerings and some questions, how did you get into libraries? What's your background? So my bachelor's degree is in family history and genealogy. You know, as I was going to school, I learned very quickly that I really loved history and not only loving history, but preserving it, right? Kind of being able to digitize documents to preserve documents. That really was an interest for me. And so as I graduated with my degree in family history and genealogy, I kind of thought, what do I do with something like this? And the most natural thing was libraries, right? Kind of looked at how do I work in libraries as a genealogist and um, oh, I'll need a master's degree in library science, right? And so as I went into that, one thing led to another and I I've always, in all of my previous jobs, been in administration. And so administration just really came easy to me with libraries. You know, everything I've been doing with that just kind of fell in place. And so by the time I ended up graduating with my master's degree, I ended up getting a job as a library director in a small rural county running their library as as the director and just kind of came natural, loved it, you know, got to focus on preserving documents, making documents available to people, um, all that kind of stuff. And, and it just branched there as I grew and over the years moved into other libraries as their director and grew my career and just being able to learn that communities are really strengthened by their libraries and the resources that are provided there. And Jared, I'm, I'm curious, did you have a connection to Reading specifically prior to coming here or, or you were just passionate about the, the opportunity itself? Previous to coming to Reading, I was the library director in Flagstaff, Arizona. I oversaw 10 branches there, and it was a very large library system. And so a lot of people, when they hear that, they're like, oh, well, why why Reading? To be honest, Reading is obviously fewer branches than it was in Arizona, but the circulation, the population here in Chance County is much larger than it was the, uh, there. And so it was still kind of a lateral move for me to grow and to be able to provide better and more services to people who have more funding, things like that. And so it still was a good connection for me and, and something that, our, you know, our family was looking for a place to settle down, buy a house, for example, who, who would have thought coming to uh, California of all places was the place to come buy a home and settle down and continue to do that. Very cool. And you kind of you kind of touched on it a little bit about like just the importance of libraries in a community. And every community seems to have a library, whether it's a very small library or whether it's a larger library system. In your opinion, why are libraries so important for a community? You know, I, as I said before, libraries build strong communities. If we kind of go back in time a little bit and look at 
before you really had libraries in communities, the ability for people to gain knowledge, to improve their lives, to give them the skills to move up in, say, a job or a career, that did not exist, right? And so you had your your poor and your paupers. And libraries became that real equalizer in our communities where It didn't matter what kind of economic situation you came from. You had access to resources that gave you the skills and the knowledge to improve your lives, right? And so I think that continues to exist today. Obviously, we have people who have um, and people who do not have. And the library continues to be that great equalizer that someone who, you know, is, say, homeless is able to come in, utilize our online resources, find a job and actually improve their life and get back into the workforce and actually become a a part of contributing to society. So that really, I think when it comes down to it, that is why libraries are so crucial. We provide, you know, literacy resources for our youth so that they can learn to read better. And we know that by, by improving your literacy skills, that your success in life goes up, so we're able to provide these to our community members, no matter what their economic situation is, so that, you know, when they graduate from high school, they gain the skills that they need to become successful and, and do great things for our community. Really well said. I, I know you mentioned there's the Bernie Library, Anderson in here, Reading, and, and obviously we encourage folks to check out Bernie and, and Anderson very much so, but for the purposes of today's conversation, we're, we're going to focus mainly on the library here in Reading. So I guess to that point, what what makes the Reading Library unique, would you say? You know, a lot of our programs, people are surprised to find are out in the community. We have a cemetery tour. We had a kayaking class not too long ago. You know, what library do you know that is doing um, programs out in the community, like a bike 101 program on how to fix your bike, that is really kind of that skill driven building skills out in the community. It's not necessarily in the four walls of the library. Um, and I think that speaks to our community, what our community is passionate about. The people, people who live here in Shasta County love the outdoors and they love to get out in the outdoors. And so a lot of our programs, we have hiking programs that we help put on people move here, like myself who didn't know where the hiking trails are. And you can go to the library and participate in a library program and they'll take you on a tour and give you the history of the, of the hike, the growing plants that are around, all that kind of stuff. You know, people don't think of that when they think of a library, the resource it is to a community. And so I think Things like our programs that are outreaching, the facility itself, you know, the fact that we have an outdoor children's area, um, our upstairs area, we have some of the best views in town out, out those windows, as well as some of our local collections that are here that are only unique to this area, like the Boggs collection. All those things, I think, really make our library stand out and make people stand back and say, whoa, wait, I had no idea that the library get these things for the community. And it might be a little early to ask this question, but I think I hear that a lot from people, even, you know, when we're when we're talking about some library programs and they're like, wow, I didn't realize the library did that or I didn't realize the library had that. What's the best way for people to connect with the library? If you're if you're talking to somebody who maybe has never been to the Reading Library or hasn't been in years, like how do they reconnect with the library? How do they stay up to date with all these cool programs and things that you have going on? I think there's three really strong ways to do it. Obviously, one would be just coming into the library. We have flyers and handouts that are always available. We have TV monitors that are constantly flipping through the different upcoming events and programs and services that we provide. So, you know, coming into the library is obviously just a great way to make sure that you're catching. Probably the second best way is our social media, following us on social media, joining the newsletter. Those things will make sure that you're always getting dinged on your mobile device of, hey, this is coming up. Don't miss it. And then I would say the last one is our website. The website is kind of a portal to a lot of resources in the library, our online digital collection, our databases and our catalog. All of those things, right, are huge parts of what we provide to the community. And so the website is also another great place that you can connect with us on.
And Jared, you mentioned you hear from folks quite a bit. They're surprised with some of the resources and the offerings that the library has. On that front, can you talk to us a little bit about the makerspace? I know that includes things like the podcast studio, and there's some 3D printing options and some augmented reality and some really cool stuff. What What is the makerspace and, and how can folks take advantage of that? So it is a space in the library that is specifically designed to create, to use that imagination and create amazing things. And so there are a number of things in there. We have uh, paper stamps. People come in, they'll get out the craft paper. They can stamp out pictures and letters to, to create things. A lot of kids really love that. We also have a cricket machine. Um, the cricket machine, you, you're feeding paper into it, and it's doing really intricate designs on the paper that you can then put together and make something like an ornament. Or if you come into the library, one of the things we just recently did um, a while back was we have an Alice in Wonderland section that we did a highlight when we were highlighting that book. And uh, the roses that were made out of that were made from this cricket, right? So with the cricket, you can do just these amazing paper projects and put them together that are just beautiful. But then we also have other resources like a sewing machine. Th this is huge. So many people come in. They use it to work on projects, to, to mend things. We've done some classes in the past, like with this, of how to mend your clothes and, and fix it. You know, that was a huge success. There's knitting resources up there. As you mentioned, we have like the virtual reality machines. We have gaming computers up there. And then obviously the 3D printers. You can go online, find anything in the world you want to print and be able to print those through the 3D printing. You know, the one thing I will say is some people might be aware that the library received a state infrastructure grant from the state library, and that brought a ton of money into the library. And so in, in our redesign of the Reading Library, when we put down new carpet, we're also kind of changing some of the things. And so there's a possibility that that creative space will actually move down into our children's area. And and, you know, the goal there being hopefully to uh, see more of our youth utilizing a lot of those resources. And just to clarify, Jared, is are all of these resources free for the community? Absolutely. And again, that comes back to the library being that great equalizer in the community. There is no cost to any of this, right? You're able to come in, sh show your credentials, a, a piece of mail that has your address on it. Those things will get you a library card and then you're off on the race, you know, getting anything and everything that the library has to offer. And I think the only thing that we really ever charge for in the library is scanning and printing, right? Obviously, there, there's that low cost, but even then it's only cents of what it costs to print and scan stuff. Jared, I'm curious. I mean, you you obviously have a wealth of experience, both from your, you know, the other libraries you've been a part of and, and your education and things of that nature. In your opinion, what in the age of kind of digital media and online resources, what what do you think the future of public libraries is? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. When the internet came on the scene and, and started becoming a, a main source that people used, you know, at that time people were like, "Oh, the, the libraries are going to die." And then we had eBooks, right? Digital books that came on, and again, people were like, "Oh, for sure." There is no need for a library, right? But libraries really surprised the community because they said, no, we're not dead. In fact, we, we often change and adapt to these new resources that come out. And the main reason that we adapt to it is, again, we realize not everybody has the same things, right? Not everybody does have a computer. So many people actually don't pay for internet. And so the only place that they can go to get it when they do need it periodically is the library. And so, yeah, when you saw the internet come on, libraries changed. They brought in computer areas, which we had, I think, over 20 public computers that people come get on. We have Wi-Fi for the building. We're seeing more people obviously come in with their own device. But again, a lot of those people don't have internet at home. So they're bringing their device to the library to connect for free Wi-Fi, get on their email, check their emails, maybe check Facebook, you know, a couple other things, maybe pay some bills. They're off doing whatever they're doing. But again, a lot of times you think of the library as a way to save money. You know, the, the fact that... There are some streaming services out there that people like. Well, people will come in here and they'll rent their favorite movies on DVD or their favorite TV shows on DVD. And those 
they're able to get that entertainment that they want without having to pay that monthly subscription fee. And so it saves them money in the, in the end. And so I think that's a large part of where no matter what continues to come down the pipeline and new innovations, when those things come, libraries pivot and say, how do we utilize this new innovation to make it available to everyone in our community so that they can have access to these things when they need them? And libraries will continue to do that, to focus on providing people and giving them the things they want. I mean, I think it's a good time to bring up um, the topic of safety because, I mean, the, the library is such a resource rich environment for a community and, and for any communities. And you just listed off, you know, a dozen great resources that the library offers to people totally free of charge. They can take advantage of it anytime. But obviously, safety is a big concern for many in our community. And it's it's not just downtown. It's it's everywhere. People are more hyper aware of their safety, I think, now more than maybe ever. And the library seems to get labeled as unsafe, even though, you know, I personally I work by the library. I've been to the library. I visit the library. I do not believe that that's true. But this narrative kind of seems to hang out into the, in the community. What do you tell people who are concerned about safety at the library? When I first started, I, I received emails and, and comments about, you know, some of the, the unhoused population that, that comes around here. And, and some of the comments were like, why do you allow these people in the library? And again, I, I think it's important to remind people that we are an institution that is available to anyone and everyone. You know, we, we aren't like a membership club type thing, right? Everyone has the ability to come into the library. One of the best examples I have is I have known a number of homeless individuals in previous libraries and here who have utilize library services to get back on their feet, to get back into housing and things like that. And so if we just shoot these people away, we would really be a kind of a detriment to many of them being able to get back on their feet and come back into society and, and, and contribute, you know, and it gives me an interesting opportunity to be around these people a lot of the time. And as we talk to them and help them and assist them, really what we find is most of these people are just normal people trying to do their very best. They're not looking to harm anyone or, or cause trouble, right? Most of them are just keeping to themselves and trying to improve their lives. And, and so we're, we're happy to have them here and, and help them. I, I'll agree with you. Most of the time I feel safe. You know, I think there might be one or two bad apples out there. And sometimes people see those one or two bad apples and that gives the bad rap for everyone else, right? But I think the reality is it's it's just one or two people who, you know, to steal a phrase, just want to see the world burn, right? And those individuals, we quickly move on and, and get them out of here because obviously they're just looking to, to make trouble, right? We have our security guards do a great job moving these people on. Police station is not very far from us. They come over whenever there's an issue and they they move these people on. But the majority of them are really just in here utilizing the library. The other aspect of that that I want to point out is if you haven't been in the library in a while, you should come check it out. You know, there's this stigma of, oh, it's overrun. It's you can't even walk in there. We've done a really good job at pointing out the difference between loitering and actually sitting and using, right? We want to move loiterers on and we want people to actually come in and use the library. And so we, we've done a really great job at cleaning up the area and making it friendly and inviting for families and everyone. And so if you haven't been in a while, I would encourage you to actually come in. Sure, you might see a person here or there, but again, most of them are actually utilizing the library in one way or the other, and they're sticking to themselves. They're not being a problem. Um, and, and it's cleaned up and it actually does feel quite safe and quite inviting. And last year when we did our Rev Rumble and more, we had, I want to say it's over 150 people walking through this library. We're about to see here in the next couple of years, the park right behind us being revamped, and redesigned. The goal is we need to make this area hustling and bustling because as we do that, People do, they feel more safe because there's a lot of people and those one or two bad apples, they don't come around where there's a lot of people. And 
And so um, the more that we come and utilize our libraries, the more that people come and utilize these spaces around here, um, it just improves the area. And, and we see less incidents than when there's no one around here, right? When there's no one around, that's when there's problems. So definitely come to the library, be part of the community that's hustling and bustling and making this place great. That's really well said, Jared. I know that the library recently completed it or is in the process of completing its strategic plan. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But as part of that strategic plan in April of, of this past year, there was a survey that went out to the community. Can you talk to us a little bit about the findings of that survey? How many community members participated in the survey and what findings um, came from it? And I guess to that point, were there any surprises in those survey results? The goal really was to provide a way for the community to let us know what they wanted to see from the library as we kind of say, where should we focus for the next few years, right? And so the survey, as well as, you know, we had a website where people go in and leave comments on the wall. All of those things really helped us get a good idea of what the community wanted from the library. Some things that I like to point out is when we asked about satisfaction, we had 68% people say that they were very satisfied with the library. We had 82% say that they were very satisfied with our customer service. From these stats that we received on that, we found that a large majority of our community really is happy with how the library is going and how it's being used. Some of the other things that were focused on in the survey that we learned is people are interested in how to programs like life skill programs. They were interested in seeing more STEM programming come for school-aged children. We learned that most people were aware that we provided computers internet and quiet spaces, things that people liked about the library or they didn't like about the library was obviously what was talked about a little bit before about our unhoused patrons. But there was a lot of positivity of um, people had positive experiences at all three of our branches. There was more requests for more ebooks and more quiet spaces and that people also wanted more cultural and interactive learning from the library. We also learned from that that most of the people that filled out the survey, the largest demographic that filled out the library was 23 to 39. Obviously, there were other groups that filled out the survey, but the largest portion there was our 29 to 39. Oh, that's a lot of very interesting findings there, actually. And then I guess from that survey, I know that you had been working on a strategic plan and you were, you know, rolling those findings into the strategic plan. Can you talk to us about the strategic plan? One, what is it? What does the library do a strategic plan for? And then maybe just some highlights from the strategic plan that you've created. Yeah, so we we obviously pulled from a lot of different areas to put together where should we focus, right? We looked at the community first, to be honest. We looked at who makes up our community here in Shasta County, their incomes that they make, you know, just everything that really gives us a good picture of who is here in Shasta County. And then we also looked at the library. We looked at how people are currently using the library. We looked at what kind of programs it built to them. We looked at what kind of marketing that we were doing was effective and what kind of marketing wasn't effective. We also looked at the technology that they use on a normal basis. We ask staff for their input because obviously our staff is the greatest resource here in the library. Um, you know, when we talked about what makes the library unique, I should have added our staff in there. Our staff are amazing, but um, because they, they are that front face of the library and uh, people come and they talk to them about, um, hey, I need help with this, or do you have this resource? So they really are that front line and they hear all these questions. So they were a valuable part of like, what are you hearing that the community wants? And so we we started pulling all this in. The last thing we did is we also brought in some focus groups, right? We brought in educational leaders. We brought in government leaders. We brought in our library partners, like the, the Library Foundation, those who volunteer here at the library. Everyone that had an interest in library, we brought in some different focus groups and we let them say, share the things we would love to see the library doing. We took all of that data, and from that data, we started seeing reoccurring themes, right? And so the four areas that really came out of all of this data that we pulled in, including the survey and all that, was library awareness. People wanted to know more about what the library provided. 
They wanted to see our spaces be more flexible where we pop up new programs or uh, create this quiet space, things like that. They they wanted to see that the library would become a community hub or a cultural connection place. And then last, we, we saw the trend of the library being a center of lifetime learning, right? And so from those overarching themes that we heard from so many different groups and directions, we decided these are the four areas that we wanted to focus on. And that's kind of what a strategic plan is. Strategic plan is place. So it gives us direction because there are so many things that we could do that would be amazing. But if we try to do all of those things, we'll do a bunch of things kind of good, but not focus on just doing a lot of really great things. And so the strategic plan helps us be able to weigh some of the things that come up is, is this in line with our strategic plan? Should we give it time and attention? Sometimes, no, it's not. Or sometimes, well, it's good, but we need to tweak it so it falls within the, the scope of what our focus is going to be for the next couple of years. So the strategic plan, it goes till 2027, right? And so we'll be able to, uh, for between now and 2027, really focus on those four areas of library innovation, making sure people are aware of what's going in the library, the infrastructure and the new redesign. We're going to really focus on creating those flexible spaces. And then we're continuously always working on bringing in resources that help us bring people together through that being, you know, a community hub, and then also providing resources so people can learn and, and grow, things like that. And so that will be our focus. And, and Jared, prior to this effort with a strategic plan, how long had it been since the previous strategic plan had been developed? Previous strategic plan just ended uh, this year. And so as soon as it ended, we jumped right into working to create the new one. And by the end of this year, you know, we've already come out with the new one and we've already started working on bits and parts of it. And so really there was only a small couple month gap of from when the last one ended and the new one started. Got it. Jared, I'm wondering too, uh, how is the library or I guess the, the three libraries, how are they funded? I know you mentioned that that you recently were awarded some some state grant monies, but overall, well, what does the funding uh, look like for the libraries? So obviously um, the largest portion of the Reading Library comes from the city of Reading. There is a budget that is allocated every year for the library to run. The city also has an agreement with the county. The county provides funds for its two branch libraries. And that is how we get our guaranteed budget every year. On top of that, we have two amazing groups, the Library Foundation and the Friends of the Library. Maybe I'll go into a little bit of how they, they're different. The the Library Foundation is solely um, focused on raising money and putting that money into an interest growing account so that at the end of the year, they can go and take the interest that grew off of all of the money that has been put in over the last decade and give that money to the library. Um, and I think last year, the foundation was able to give us $92,000, if I remember right. So not a not anything to ignore, right? That That's a significant amount of money that just helps us go into funding different great projects. The Friends of the Library, a little bit different. You know, they are, they constantly are taking donations in from the community as people discard books that they no longer need. They give those to the friends. The friends go through and, and pick out books and they'll put them in the bookstore and they'll, they'll sell them for, I, I believe it's a dollar or two dollars. Every day that the library is open, the bookstore is open, people come in and buy a cheap book at the bookstore. They also put on a patio sale the first Saturday of every month. They'll put books out into our community room. Again, you can come buy those for a dollar. And then, you know, some books they get are actually quite valuable. And so they have an online portal where they will take these books that are a little bit more expensive and, and sell them for still a discounted price, you know, but it's not a dollar. And all the money that they then gather this way through the year, they then uh, give it to the library. You know, most of our summer reading program funding and all that comes from the Friends of the Library as well as some funding for a, a good portion of our programs as well as buying books and things like that. You know, without these two groups, we would not be able to do half of what we do. Um, and that goes for all those who volunteer here at the library. We have people who come in and volunteer to help put books away that have been returned. 
That's a huge success. So, you know, I just want to put a shout out there. If you're looking for a way to serve and volunteer, highly recommend that you come talk to us. We would love to have you come volunteer and help us at library. We cannot do half of the most amazing things that we do without our volunteers and without the support of our foundation and friends. And I also think it's worth mentioning, Jared, just the number of visits that you see every year. I think the most recent stat I saw from last year was almost close to half a million visits that come into the library, which is actually maybe a little low after the pandemic. Can you talk to us, like, what's the average yearly visit number that you see from the community. I want people to realize that, I mean, people are visiting the library. There's a lot of great resources there. And this is, if you aren't visiting the library, you're missing out. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, you know, when I, when I give you these numbers, I, I think you'll be blown away. But really, like, think about how many people came in. They're coming in for a reason. You're missing out if you're not using the library. So you really should say, hey, can I save some money? I need to go see what the library has. Or, you know, I'm looking for some kind of entertainment, whether it's TV, movies, books, other fun gaming resources, some kind of way to connect with people in my community by attending a program that I'm interested in. There's things that you want. So when we talk about how many people came to the library, when we're looking at just 2020, we had over 416,000 people walk through our doors. You're right. Almost half a million. And that's amazing. And you're right. We're coming out of the pandemic. We know that the pandemic brought us down. And every month, we continue to see those numbers increase as we get back to pre-pandemic numbers. And so we'll get back up there for sure. But I mean, that is no small number to to shake your head at. When we look at like physical items being checked out of the library, we circulated over 395,000 physical items. Our digital collection circulated over 94,000 items. It's pretty significant. Wow, that really is amazing. Uh, and I guess kind of to, to circle back, Jared, just going back to kind of some of the perks of acquiring your library card, just so we're, we're making it clear to folks. So there's no cost to to secure your library card. You come in with with either a, as you mentioned, an ID or a, a bill with your name on it or something along the, along those lines to get your free library card. What other perks are uh, you mentioned? The digital library collection is that is that the Libby system or is there an, another system with that? Also, some libraries, maybe in larger areas, offer museum passes or things of that nature. What are some of the other perks of that would you know maybe in uh, encourage a community member to come in and get that library card? Yeah, so you will need your driver's license and. Uh, a piece of mail with your address on it. Once you come in, you get your library card. Obviously, you can check out anything that the library has. You know, I, I see kids all the time walking with a stack of items that they're so excited to check out. But we also do have museum passes, right? We have passes to Turtle Bay. That, again, is a great resource here in our community that not everyone, not every family can afford that, right? But you can come with that library card and check out a pass and take your family. It is a family pass to, say, Turtle Bay. We also have national parks passes that are available with the library card. So, you know, when I first moved here, I had never been to Bernie Falls. And I went and checked out one of our national park passes, got into the park for free, was able to save myself some money and actually go down and see Bernie Falls for the first time. And how beautiful is that? I grew up in Idaho and, and we have a Shoshone Falls, which is the Niagara of the West. But I will tell you what, Bernie Falls is just as beautiful of a fall as, you know, some of the best around in the area. So those those passes that we have really come in beneficial um, with that library card. You can also, yeah, get access to our Libby app. So the Libby app can be downloaded on any um, smart device. You can even access it on your web page. Um, and all it does is you take your library card, log it in, and you have access to thousands of ebooks and audiobooks. And now they're also doing magazines. So you know, say you're a cyclist and you subscribe to a bike magazine that you love. You may find that we actually have that magazine. You might be able to save your save some money by no longer subscribing to that and getting it free through, through the library. Um, you know how many how many women out there are subscribing to Joanna Gaines's uh, magazine, which is a great magazine. Again, it's there on Libby for you to be able to check out. People just I don't think they realize how much your library card can give you and save you in in 
I'm curious too, Jay. I mean, I'm an avid Libby user. How does that work? I mean, you mentioned the digital collection. Does the library itself pay a certain amount for that digital collection? Are some digital collections larger at some libraries than others? I mean, how does the online portion work? Shasta Public Libraries is part of a consortium. The, we call it the North State Consortium. And so from Sacramento up to the border, um, any library in the north part of the state um, is part of this North State Consortium. And so when we buy an ebook, it is available not only to our patrons, but also to anyone here in the North State, as well as any of the other libraries. They, they buy books as well. And so all of that we're sharing basically those e-books for everyone. And so, yeah, it's something that we have a budget that we allocate funds to, to make sure that we're buying things that are new and coming out that people want, but we, we get the benefit of other people buying books and using their books and they get the benefit of us buying books and, and them using it. And so that's kind of basically how that system works, but because it's part of that consortium, the amount of books that are available is just wide and and overreaching and you can I, I won't say that it's impossible but you can find titles that just aren't on there um and the libby app is really nice in the fact that you can then request that you know and if we see enough people requesting a specific title one of us will end up buying it so that it becomes available you know there there's some of those hard to reach titles i should say that you know only one or two people are interested in so we're more than likely not going to buy that but we have a program called our Zip Book program where you can come into the library. You can request that book. If we don't have it, it will be purchased from Amazon and shipped directly to your home. And then once you're done reading it, you'll bring it back to the library and then we'll actually look to see if it's a book that we want to add into the collection. So that's another great resource. If you're looking for a title that you just can't find anywhere, that program is a great one to take advantage of. Wow, that's that's cool. Jared, there's so many cool, unique things that I'm learning about the library today. I, I realize I'm not, I need to bring my family into the library more often. I guess, on, I mean, on that front, just a, a quick logistics question. You mentioned, you know, the National Park passes, which is amazing. The museum passes, the makerspace for for things of that nature. Do you have to reserve those ahead of time or it's kind of first come, first serve? You show up at the library with your card and, and if it's available, you're, you're welcome to it. So if you go online, and this is kind of true of anything, if I go online and there's a book I want, I can place a hold on it. It will be pulled for me. Or if someone else already has it checked out, I'll be put in the queue for when it becomes available. I'll get notified that it's here and it'll be waiting on our hold shell. Park passes, are, I believe, are similar. You can place a hold on that as well as the Turtle Bay ones. We only have a limited number of them, so sometimes they are all checked out. But as soon as one comes available and you're next up in the queue, you'll get notified that, hey, it's it's here and it's ready to be picked up and you can come in and and pick it up. And so that's a really great feature that you can use to get into the line, maybe the waiting line, if, if it's long to, to be able to get some of that stuff. Well, we have covered some amazing information today. Like Steve said, I feel like I learned so much about the library and I thought I already knew a lot about the library. So I guess just to wrap up, what's your favorite aspect of working in the library and what keeps you motivated in your role? You know, there's a couple of things. Uh, making a, a difference in people's lives. That's really rewarding when you have been working with a patron who maybe is unhoused and they come in all excited that they got the job that they were applying for. And, and you can see how that moved them. That, that really does make it a difference in your life and in the things that you can do. You know, many of our librarians have this experience where someone's looking for a resource. Maybe it's a, a college student who is looking for something for a research paper and you've been helping them. They come in and tell you the grade that they got on the assignment and they're so thankful for all the help. Those things really do touch you. You know, my some of my kids are older and some of my kids are younger, right? And I grab a couple picture books. You know, we all love picture books. Beautiful illustrations with fun stories. And I sat down with my youngest to read him some of these picture books. And I found that all of my kids gather together, even the older ones. And, you know, sitting together as a family, reading a story like that. And sometimes there's nothing better than that to connect with your family and sit down and read a fun story that everyone's giggling at, right? That That's one of the, the aspects I love most about this job. 